Hey, folks, it's spoiler in time. Uh, that's where we take all that great information we talk about on our other show, Cord Killers, use it to watch things, and then talk about them. This week, uh, Sarah Lane joins me. Brian is on the road, uh, but we are going to talk about Blade Runner 2049, Mr. Robot, episode one of season three. And Sarah, guess what? What? We're also going to talk about the winter movie draft. Yay. Oh, right. That. <laughs> I don't know why you're saying that Studio Feline is in first place. Uh, <laughs> you are in first place right now with 100,634,000 right in front of Big and Tall at 100,041,000. Well, Tom, thank you for the support. I'm aware of what I'm up against. <laughs> and I, I'm not sure that I have that much faith that I will uh, remain in first place much longer. Um Particularly because uh, Blade Runner has gotten such accolades, yet uh, didn't bring in the kind of box office gross that I would have liked. Um, the box office gross is awful. If you look back over this movie draft, and I know we're just getting into October, it's back to school season, so it's going to be low. Kingsman mm -mm. only made $89 million. I know. I know. I mean, um, when it, you compare uh, that, that wait. is the only one that's made more than Blade Runner. Blade Runner has made sixty point five million. It'll probably pass Kingsman. This is the reason that I should never be part of any draft. I mean, <laughs> this is the movie draft. I'm in a football draft. Every all the decisions I make are based on like, here's who I like the most, and uh, it never actually leads me to any good conclusion. So. Um, I, I won't know. be participating just, <laughs> next year. I'm trying to say is I don't think this is as bad as it looks. I mean, yes, the opening weekend box office for Blade Runner just looked awful. And $60 million after a couple weeks out doesn't look great. Yeah, I mean, but it's not going to skyrocket at any point, you know, first, throughout the first, holiday but season. It, it's still the second highest grossing movie. And the first highest grossing movie has been out since September 22nd. Tom, that is sad. I that's know not you're like not going to, cool we've got last that's Jedi like, coming. Uh, Everyone's saving their money for last Jedi, but the box office numbers are awful uh, right now. What you have Suburbicon, which is getting a lot of advertising, but it's probably not going to be huge. That's your last movie though, huh? Uh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I, you know, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic, but I don't think this is my uh, winter movie draft year. That's fine. You know, it's all about it's all about fun and companionship and whatever. But sure. uh, how how are your movies doing? Well, we uh, have had two out. Uh, uh, Flatliners flatlined, as though the headline said, fifteen point six million. Uh, Lego Ninjago movie also disappointing. Uh, it should have done better, but it did fifty one point five million. So that's why I say, like, I don't think these numbers are are normal numbers. I'm it's, curious. It, yeah, if it's. it's they're just low across the board. Yeah. I'm curious if everything bounces back uh, as we get farther into the fall or if this holds. And if, I don't know, if Last yeah, Jedi even I mean, disappoints. You know, that considering that this show is cord killers, I mean, I you know there are a lot of movies that I don't see in the theater anymore because I know I can get at home right. if I'm not in a huge hurry to see them. Um, and I know I'm not alone in that. And... I, you know, I live in Los Angeles. We get, you know, everything is first run. You know, oh, we, yeah. we, you know, wonderful theaters, big and small, the whole thing. And I don't go as much as I went in San Francisco. Um, and it's not because I don't like it. I just have other options. So you know, it's funny. I, I was actually kind of grumbling because Eileen had seen Blade Runner 2049 already. And I didn't get to see it on opening weekend because we were traveling and I'm like, well, I should probably go see it. But I'm like, ah, oh, it takes so much time because you have to drive over there. You have to park. <laughs> you have to walk up. Wait in line free... for popcorn. I mean, it takes a lot of time out of your day. And then, of course, so I go to a mall where I've registered my license plates so that I don't have to stop and take a ticket. I, I drive in. It automatically opens the gate. I have no problem parking because it's early enough in the day. I walk in, uh, use my watch. Uh, to scan my ticket, sit down in my seat, like right as the previews are starting. Right. It is literally seamless. Yeah, it is the <laughs> simplest way I've ever seen a movie. 
Um, but even that, even that, I, I'm still like, oh, but seeing a movie is takes so much time and effort to go somewhere. The other thing I noticed is uh, AMC Theater here was advertising like movie theaters aren't just for movies. You can watch esports and special events, and like they really are starting to push that idea of like, uh oh, <laughs> this box office is not going to come back. Yeah, yeah, very true. It's funny, um, when I um, was complaining about Baby Driver, uh, well, I complained about it on the show, but to uh, some friends of mine who liked it a lot last night after I finished watching it, um, they were like, you know what? You needed to see that in the theater, the sound mixing and the, you know, the whole, that, that yeah. you know, it's 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 an experience that you, you missed and that's why you didn't like the movie. And I was like, eh, yeah, that's true, but like, a lot of us have home theaters. Uh, like, I mean, if it's not yeah, wowing it's not like me the movie in my home, at home theater, is like, I'm still not going to yeah. like it. Yeah. Uh, well, to recap movie draft this week, uh, Happy Death Day and The Foreigner came out. Those are both team jury. Uh, Happy Death Day did 26.5 million and The Foreigner did 12.8 million. Next week, team jury has Tyler Berry's Boo 2, a Medea Halloween. I have a feeling this one's going to do better. This is this is my canary in the coal mine for the box office this fall. Geostorm, which I will be the only person to see, but I'm very excited about because I love a good disaster movie, is coming out. That's Team Cord Killer's movie. And uh, The Snowman is our movie, Brian and my movie. Uh, so you should all go see that as well in large numbers. It's, looks very scary and holiday at the same time. It's the perfect October movie. All right. Let's move on to talk about <laughs> Mr. Robot, the season premiere. I was not in anticipation of Mr. Robot coming back as much as I should have been until right before it was on. And then I got all excited because they did a great pre, you know, like previously on, like reminded me of all the salient points and all the things I needed to know and where we were with his story. How did you feel about Mr. Robot going in, Sarah? Uh, going in, I was like, eh. so uh, season one of Mr. Robot was incredible. Um, got a lot of attention, really interesting. You know, anybody who kind of likes trying to like find little holes and the way that they explain computers and, and, you know, hacking and that sort of stuff, you know, it's kind of fun. And in, in that sense, the second season was like some cinematic experiment. I feel like Somebody said like, okay, uh, you know, showrunner that was successful first season, go nuts. And in that sense, it was fun to watch and also kind of boring to me. The first season was much more interesting than the second season. Um, and the first episode of season three felt to me like it was staying on course of like, wow, like kind of crazy, almost like music video stuff that we're watching, but I'm less interested than I was at the beginning. I think that's, there's, there's a lot, I'm very curious how the rest of the season plays for me because I, I'm not too far off what, what you were feeling with this first episode. I wasn't disappointed, but a lot of it felt familiar at this point. Like, okay, we're, we're still trying to figure out where the line between Mr. Robot and Elliot is. And, and that was really interesting the first season, obviously, because we didn't know. And right. it was somewhat interesting in the second season because it was like, well, how does he deal with it now that he's aware? But now it feels like it's kind of an old hat and they're going to have to do something really interesting to make me care about it. And I guess what they did in the first episode was just keep Mr. Robot out and have him hide and have Elliot wonder where he is. So when he comes back, as it appears he will, according to the previews, uh, I'm curious where they treat him there. They also uh, had his his friend sort of, you know, playing both sides, double agent helping him. I think that's supposed to be the big mystery intrigue. It's a mystery that I'm curious about. It's not as deep of a mystery as I've come to, be, as I'm used to for Mr. Robot. So I'm expecting a twist. I'm expecting an even deeper mystery behind that. Uh, and otherwise, I don't know, you know, showing President Trump the way they showed President Obama, it feels like they're doing, you know, okay, well, now we're doing a trick for this season and under the new reality. Uh, I'm just I not. Did, I did definitely s sit up at attention at that point. Yeah. Well, I was like, oh my goodness, okay, we're making this statement. 
Well, and I, I'm just not as into the world as I was when it was new, <laughs> when it was like, hey, this is your world, it, but hacked. Uh, so I, I want to, I, I guess what I'm, I'm my, my jury is out and I'm, I'm waiting for them uh, to rule on whether they're going to give me evidence of, of compelling advancement of the story. I fully expect them to do so, and I don't expect them to have done so in episode one. So I'm, I'm just kind of in a holding pattern, I guess. Yeah, you know, the, the Mr. Robot uh, evolution just reminds me of so many series that I love where when you start really caring about the characters as, you know, seasons unfold, it becomes more cerebral. And yeah. I'm just not sure that this is the show to do that, at least for me, where I kind of want to be in their heads all the time. I, I'm more interested in like how, you know, we, we, you know, cripple these companies and, you know, uh, you know, hack the government and, and those sorts of details. Yeah. I think that's why Angela's story is the most compelling possibility to me because yeah. She's she's working that side of the fence, right? And and she you you don't really know what her motivations are at this point because at on the one hand she wants to uh she wants to uncover the truth for her family, for her father. On the other hand, she seems to be willing at, at the drop of a hat to to cooperate with these big companies. So, um you 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 really don't know where she's going uh, with well, this. Well, yeah, and that's problematic too because she's supposed to be so close to Elliot and it's like, mm, are you really that cold? Like, I don't know what's going on. So probably there's a lot more to the story. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like it's it's like her whole thing right now is like annoying to me. I'm like, come on, Angela. Well, and then Darlene is just kind of left out there floating, right? She's like yeah, freaking she's out all the time. Uh, and, and she used to be the solid... Uh, uh, the, the solid uh, opposite to Elliot's freaking out. And I guess maybe the idea is that Elliot's a little more solid than he used to be. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, yeah, Elliot has not really shown a whole lot of being solid ever. Um, it's also like the two of them, you know, and their siblings and the, you know, there's so many close ups on their faces, you know, and they're just like, uh, and it's like, sometimes I'm just like, this is hard to watch, you know, like yeah. everyone's so morose all the time. Claustrophobic. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of. Yeah. I want more white rose. We got a little bit, tiny bit, a little pinch. I want, I want more of that. I want more of that storyline and her messing with time. And you know, it doesn't have to get mystical. It, it doesn't have to be a fantasy suddenly, but you know, I'd like to see some, some over the top stuff. Uh, we did get a little, real hacking in this episode, which is always good. I like, I like to see that. Um, so yeah, I, I don't have anything bad to say about this episode, but it is so much a part of an art overarching story that it's, it's hard to know what I feel yet without seeing more of it. Well, it's also tough because the whole conflict that the first episode sets up is that Elliot wants to stop and undo everything he's been doing the last two seasons, which is a hard thing to swallow because I know for me, I, I, I was thinking, hey, uh, why? <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> but you, but yeah, because it's just a half it, measure. The, the, the opposition that they're trying to set up is Mr. Robot wants to keep it going. Elliot doesn't. Mm -hmm. And then all the various forces that are trying to get him to either go or stay. And maybe if he goes, that's a, that or the way, maybe if he tries to stay, it's actually going to help them go. That's the tricky part. But you're right. Like he always wanted to bring down evil corp too yeah uh and this it, it this whole plan like I, I feel like uh i think what they're trying to set up is a false sense of security for elliot uh between yeah. you know them meeting at the barbecue place and and irving i think is the name on the, the business card that he has uh uh he's he says okay you want us to end it we'll end it uh and of why of course not why would they yeah, yeah. And, no, I, he, and i feel like elliot's too smart to trust that i mean here's a guy who used to sit down and and tell people like how he he had hacked them and doxed them online yeah. and he he's not going to fall for the the barbecue ruse is he and, no and i think i think i think the big I, I i was watching this episode and i thought i really did not like in season 2 how everyone's fan theories uh, came true and were discovered very quickly. So I'm, I, I, 
uh, thought, okay, well, I don't want to go and look into any of that stuff. But like thinking about the, at least this episode, I get the sense that we're going to see power wrested away from Elliot just entirely. Like the, this, mm-hmm. is, it's going to come out uh, some of what was said in this episode that this is a plan that is probably th- decades in the making and is not Elliot's to own. You know, I do get why Elliot might decide it's gone too far and want to back out. Uh, but but sure. I'd like a little more. Any last thoughts, Sarah, before we move on? Um, no, I, you know, I'll keep watching Mr. Robot. I mean, I'm, I'm invested. <laughs> oh yeah, me too. I'm hopeful even that, that I'm yeah. going to be pleasantly. Oh yeah, uh, like thrilled. it wasn't a bad episode. I was just sort of like, hmm, where are we going? This sort yeah. of seems like, like you said, more of the same, but I'll be watching. All right. Well, we're going to talk about Blade Runner 2049. Uh, and I, Sarah hasn't seen it, but she's okay being spoiled. So we will be spoiling things. Uh, Brian held yep. off on talking about it last week until I'd seen it. And now I've seen it. And so is Brian, but Brian's not here. He's not here. So Bryce, we'll probably talk about it again next week as well okay. with Brian. Sure. Uh, but the, the couple of things that I wanted to put out there, my impressions were this was a great continuity of the original to me. I very much felt like I was watching 30 years later of that movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, part of the reason is it's so noir that it's, it's, it kind of remains timeless itself. So it doesn't look dated when you mimic parts of it to me. I also, I also felt like I enjoyed everything. Everything made sense. Uh, but it's all very reasoned points you're making Tom. It never thrilled me. It never got me out of my seat. It never made me gasp, mm-hmm. uh, which is why I, like a halfway through the movie, I was like, this is amazing. I love what they're doing. And then by the end, I'm like, uh, the twist didn't blow me away. It's not like I saw it coming, but it wasn't wasn't the thing that really got me mm-hmm. out of my seat. And it's just it's just pretty great. Yeah, uh, it's I, not. But it's still great. Like I still had a great time in watching it. Yeah, it it really isn't an explosive twist. I I was surprised when they they revealed it uh, about uh, Kay's lineage, uh, because because I think they do an all right job making you think. All right, they're being moody. Just like tell tell Deckard that you think you're his child or whatever, uh, and. Uh, I, I, my, my thinking was like, okay, so they're just really drawing this out and this is just going to be it. And then when it dropped that, uh, it was not, it, it couldn't possibly be K. Uh, my immediate reaction was, oh yeah, no, it definitely doesn't make any sense that he would be, <laughs> Yeah, you know? And I kind of had that same journey. Yeah. And it's, it's, uh, I like that pretty much up until that point, the K's story kind of parallels Deckard's from from the first movie and and then that's kind of where it branches off into he's no longer trying to find you know a a a a relationship with with this other uh uh, person but he is now acting as a vessel for 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 uh, uh for somebody else yeah and with and with Deckard you never knew whether he was a replicant or not Mm-hmm. You still don't. They don't even bother touching on that I don't, mystery. I, I I thought it was interesting that with K right up front, they're yeah. like replicant, just so you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> and and I do like that they very purposefully do not give whether Deckard is a replicant or not. Uh I think it's it's weird, and if you ask me, there's a definite answer, and that answer is that he definitely is. Uh, but, uh, that, that would not be a good mystery or would it? Well, I don't know. I mean, if, if a replicant can have a baby, would it have to be with another replicant or would it have to be with a human? I mean, that's a good point, right? Because if, if presumably if Deckard and Rachel are replicants, well, and this is where the blackout comes in is that even if they had documentation, a lot of stuff got lost 10 or 15 years previous. So, uh, uh, that that ambiguity is cool, but I think all all possible options contained don't change too much about the stakes of the movie. The one thing, as I was being convinced that Kay was Deckard's son, mm-hmm. uh, I was thinking in my mind, well, so I guess they had to fake 
his serial number because they do the test on him and they look at his eye. And as we've seen, eyes all have serial numbers. But if he was born, he wouldn't have been born with a serial number. So did they put one? You know, I was like spinning that around. And then when it turns out like, oh, OK, now there you go. That's how he got a serial number. That's easy. Yeah. I um, mean, he was a police replicant he was uh, presumably yeah. bought and made for police work pretty would... good background <laughs> checks on those models i'm gonna guess right um, uh, and then what did you think about uh about uh uh well let's start with, like what did you think about love uh as sort of the the hands <laughs> of of uh uh not not tyrell but the uh, jared leto leto's character uh yeah i wallace right wallace i right was prepared not to like her. I was prepared to think she was more one dimensional. I ended up liking her a lot more mm -hmm. than I thought I would. Uh, she was played with a lot more emotion and a lot more depth than I was expecting. So I, and I ended up surprisingly liking her. Yeah. I mean, she has a pretty believable, uh, a pretty believable motive to, yeah. to, to keep working for Wallace and, and the fact that she is able to lie and and push what we would what are implied to be the laws of replicants uh, in killing uh, Lieutenant Joshi uh, shows shows how powerful she is outside of just being physically offensive. Because we also do get to see that she can scrap in one of the only one of the very few fight scenes in the movie. Yeah, uh, and and she holds herself really really competently. So. I, I think she is a really good foe uh, for Kay. The one piece of story that broke down for me, the only piece that I couldn't wave away or excuse or or just let go, which mm. the, every movie has those, uh, the one piece that bothered me was when Kay is abducted for being in the wrong place, has a test where he shows he's far from his baseline, mm -hmm. And then just says to the commander, oh, but I, I found the kid that it's all taken care of. And she just believes him. Yeah. He had to freaking bring an eyeball from Dave Batista in. Uh, and that wasn't even controversial. Mm -hmm. I did found it hard to swallow that his commander would just be like, yeah, all right. Yeah, you've been acting weird, but I'll, I'll believe you. Here's 48 hours head start. Get out of here, kid. Do you think it could be because his... I, I would presume that for him to do what he was ordered to do, which was to make the entire case disappear, that he would have to break some sort of programming, what we, what we, what we might consider to be standard Yeah, that's fair. I, I just feel like even though the commander liked him mm -hmm. and wanted to help him, she was also so worked up about this possibly causing world war that she'd want a little more proof from a very recently diagnosed as defective replicant. Yeah, no, that that's a good point. And um, I, do you think she believed him? I mean, she it, seemed to. I mean, if she if she let him go, right? She does give him that head start. I, well, I don't know because she either believes him. Or she doesn't, and if she doesn't, here's the thing. Then, then at the time it happened, it bothered me people. less than later. At uh. the time that it happened in the movie, I still think Kay is the son. So in my head, I'm like, oh, maybe she knows, and this is him passing a test to say I won't tell anybody, oh. and that's why she gives him the 48 hours, okay, so that he can he can get out of there and disappear and save the world, and therefore she's satisfied. Yeah. When it turns out that he's not, I'm like, well, then that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> uh. All of that, yeah, that is that is a weird a weird plot plot point. Uh, what do you think about uh, uh, for for me? Probably the biggest like shock of the movie, and this was another sort of like guided thought process from from the storytelling, was that I did not think for a second that they were going to show any uh, one frame of Rachel R Rachel's character. Yeah, and when when it sh when when her silhouette showed up in the Wallace the Wallace office, I audibly gasped. Yeah, uh, and then you know they they showed the previous footage from the f from the first film, and then they they she actually comes into the light, and and it's a it's a body double with they with some sort of uh, Rachel Sean Young thing possibly, yep. and I was I was 
blown away that they did it at all. Apparently, it was a super huge production secret. Uh, and I also think they do they handle it really well. The idea, it was motivated. Yeah, it was not something where I felt like, "Hey, let's show Rachel." It was it was the kind of thing that Wallace would have done. He's been built up to be that kind of person who would have done that. And the fact that he shoots her right away, I think, makes it clear. Like, okay, this was this was on purpose. This is meant to get at Deckard. Mm-hmm. What What did you also think about the? I guess just the general stakes of Fort Twenty Forty Nine, right? The idea of like a organic replicant birth and the sort of I don't know. start of I, a revolution. I, that's one of those ones where I tried not to think about that too hard because I'm like, mm. there's there are all kinds of reasons there could be a conflict after all of the, you know, after after the replicants revolted and the colonies. I'll just believe that, you know, this kind of thing could cause unrest and I, I'm not going to stare too closely at it. Um, but yeah, the idea that replicants could have babies seems like it could also have been a unifying factor for humans and replicants because hey now we now we're uh totally uh, alike we, and right but and and to to the point of like not only is it like feeding into that the the actual replicants cause but you've also got of course wallace and love who want to find and harness that power for their own like yeah. their own godlike control and I think that conflict really doesn't come across at as much, all as much as it should. And yeah. that, and <clears throat> you would think a third movie would be huge, would be almost dedicated to something like that. But I, I, I don't know what you, where I don't know where you go or what you do with any of that information if the story doesn't, if the world doesn't continue on. Yeah, I mean, I mean this. They're obviously setting it up for a rebellion, mm-hmm. right? And it's going to be led by Deckard's daughter, uh, and that's that's where we're headed next. If there ever was more of this story, um, which is almost mundane, uh, mm-hmm. considering. So you'd have you. I I, um, I I feel like they're not ruling out the possibility of another Blade Runner, but not not forcing it. You know, yeah. this is a perfectly self-contained movie, and the end is the end. Uh, and I don't need to see anything else. Uh, I might like to see something else depending on what was made but i didn't end up this movie like oh great now i have to wait for the sequel to find out what happens like it you can just sort of leave it where they left it i also really like the advances to the world i mean the the uh the woman who was Kay's, you know girlfriend uh i i thought that was really interesting and the kind of thing that a that a replicant would have no problem uh developing a relationship with mm-hmm. it was a little bit of kind of a a the way it was handled as as sort of a kinky, like, oh, that's what you're into. That's cool. Uh, just felt real, like that was a real part of that world. I j- the only thing I couldn't figure out is where she was projected from when that thing was in his pocket. <laughs> I mean, that's that's the magic of it, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, I I actually thought it was more... They they do the the this weird like visual bit with that when he gets the little... I don't, I don't know what it's called, the wand thing. Yeah. Where, like... She is suddenly able to move, I guess, outside of her normal track. Yeah. But you don't get this, you don't get a perfect sense that she's stuck on rails with this overhead projection thing at all. Uh, And so, like, that's the very first thing. And she's just like, she kind of like sidesteps, and that's her thing. I don't know. It was, uh, yeah, exactly. It's, it, it, it's a fine conceit to make yeah, yeah. to to take make an AI love interest and get them out of a, an apartment. Uh, well, overall, I did think it was great, and I would recommend people go see it and bring up the box office for Team Feline. Oh, uh, 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 Nuke Jello points in in the chat. What did you think of the uh, the love scene between Kay and Joy and Mackenzie Davis's character? Uh, the 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 love making oh the sequence. merged thing that was that was creative right uh, it I, was, what I liked yeah. is that I I thought she was gonna like take over Mackenzie Davis and we we wouldn't we'd only see Joy and the fact that she kind of always was a little bit off right uh-huh. like the hands would not always match up uh, I thought that was a a, a well done detail 
the it, it was a it, and it's a, in a, a like a really impressive scene in terms of graphics and the, the CG. Uh, also, kind of a long sequence. Yeah, it was a little long, a little it, lengthy, it kind especially of for that movie. Yeah, right. Uh, I. I, I, I think they I was, wanted to show that that asynchronous aspect of it. They really wanted you to get a sense of that. That that was yeah. my guess. Uh, but I just remember thinking, like, I bet this would be like if if robots if if replicants were watching TV, this would be like the sex scene that would ick them out in front of their replicant parents. You're like, <laughs> oh yeah, we're yeah. yes. I don't Deckard's <laughs> daughter is not going to want to watch this with Rachel and Deckard. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I thought this was a really uh, appropriate sequel, and I think it does keep a lot of the really good world building. Did you did you watch the prequel? Short I watched films? a couple of them. I didn't actually watch all of them because I was mm-hmm. I, after watching a couple, I started to feel like I was learning too much. Uh, so I mean to go back and watch them now. I I uh, I ended up watching them right before I went to go see it, and I think they I I don't think they affect your enjoyment of the movie at all. Um. <laughs> outside of like it gives uh Bautista's character uh his is the one that's labeled 2048 and so it's basically the immediate lead up of why he was found out and yeah yeah you know and even then it's it's just to like round out who he is as a character rather than some perp at the beginning of the movie but i think they're they're really good one of them is showing off exactly what sets off the blackout and and causes the massive information loss and then the other one is this weird uh like conversational scene with wallace and a replicant and a a a a uh, a, a motley crew of lawmakers as he uh, is convincing them to let him build replicants again again yeah yeah uh, well, cool. I'm going to go watch those right now. Yeah. And uh, Sarah Lane, if we haven't put you to sleep, uh, thank no, you. No, it's fine. I I, I was interested, <laughs> but at the same time, I was like, la, 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 I'll see it one day and I'll just like pretend I never heard all the stuff. <laughs> yeah, you'll forget all this by then anyway. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thanks again uh, for, for joining us. Where can people find more of what you do online? Oh, uh, twitter.com slash Sarah Lane, uh, DTN, uh, daily tech news show.com. And certainly, um, because we always want to thank everybody who have helped me be part of DTNS regularly, patreon.com slash DTNS. Absolutely. If you want to support the cause. I'll we'll get back, back to talking tomorrow. about Firefly next week. I promise. Uh, in the meantime, we'll spoil you next time. Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> <laughs>